Namaskar, good afternoon. If the coffee doesn't wake you up, we certainly are going to try to do just that. Um, let me begin by thanking Manjeet Kripalani and all the wonderful team members of Gateway House. It's a fantastic initiative, the first of many, and uh, I'm very privileged and happy to be here. We have a fantastic panel as well. I'm sure you can read their bios on the notes that you have, so I won't waste time reading all of it out. Just to say that uh, uh, it's terrific to have a spokesperson from the External Affairs Ministry. I know what a tough job he must have, a schizophrenic existence, given that he's also a, a, an author. His book has been translated, his books, into more than 40 languages. And Slumdog Millionaire, of course, is a movie that you're all very familiar with. And uh, the, it's based on his book, uh, which he'll talk about at, at some point. Um, Kabi Vikas, take a bow. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you very much. Kabir Khan is uh, an award-winning, not just a film writer, director, producer, but also a fantastic photographer who has uh, documented Afghanistan, his movie Bajrangi Bhaijan, which some of you may have watched, or most of you must have watched, uh, was in many ways a, a, a path-breaking landmark film that uh, he will be discussing later on the panel. I won't spoil it for you by telling you what it was about. It's an emotionally charged story which I think contributed a great deal to our relationships with our neighbor. And uh, let's, uh, let's give the neighbor a name, relationships with Pakistan. Um, Hugo Vai He, I've got it right. Vai He Guruji, he says, is what he's known as across the world. Uh, I have known Hugo for a long time as uh, Someone passionate about what he does, passionate about the arts, passionate specifically about art out of, Asian, out of Asia, Asian art, and now he's the CEO of Saffron Art. So he's going to be telling us exactly what he does at Saffron Art to make sure that uh, India stays where it is, where it deserves to be, and where it's likely to be in, in the coming years. Now, as I'm sure a lot of us will agree, Indians are skillful negotiators. We negotiate crossroads particularly well. And this afternoon, we are going to be dealing with many such challenges. India, uh, as Manjeet has pointed out in her notes, is looking at a multicultural, different areas of influence, along with uh, an economically balanced ecologically balanced economic growth. Oh my God, that's very complicated, Manjeet. Next time, just make it simpler. Um, I was reading something that uh, Jaya Jetli, who's been a great ambassador for the crafts and skills of India over the last few decades, what she said, and I think it in many ways encapsulates what soft power means. She talked about creating uh, craft bazaars across the world and a culture of craft bazaars to help different countries and different skill sets meet in a more meaningful way. And I thought how wonderful if we could also have a culture of ideas and bazaars where we can share our ideas on equal platforms, and I think that's happening. Mr. Narendra Modi recently also talked about diplomacy and sagacity, which I thought was a fabulous combination of words which are emotive as well as profound. The Economist has done a piece where they talk about uh, once diffident, India is beginning to join the, the dance. And uh, we can look at it either as being something slightly patronizing, uh, which I thought it was. Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's time that we looked at ourselves differently and we made sure that the world looks, as at, uh, looks at us differently as well. So I'd like to ask, um, start with Vikas. It's going to be a free-flowing conversation, a free-flowing discussion. And 
I would uh, request my panelists to interrupt if they need to, or contribute if they want to, and generally keep everybody awake on a very humid and hot afternoon in Mumbai. So Vikas, when you wrote the book, and the movie was made of that book, there was also talk of how India has, especially cinema in India, has specialized in exporting poverty. It started with, um, the comment was made, of course, with uh, Satyajit Ray and Pathir Panjali. How did you feel about the varied responses to your book initially? You launched it across the world. You had conversations about the book and the movie across the world. You've been on various red carpets. So what was that whole experience like? Did you feel defensive in some way? Were we exoticizing poverty? Well, since we are talking about soft power, <coughs> I must say that uh, Slumdog Millionaire, in a sense, has contributed to the evolution of India's soft power. I'll just give you a very simple example. Uh, I was posted in South Africa at that time when I received the invite to come for the Academy Awards. <coughs> so I took a flight which uh, went from Johannesburg to Atlanta, which was the hub of uh, United Airlines, and from there to uh, Los Angeles. So when I arrived in Atlanta, it was 5.30 a.m. in the morning and a very jaded looking uh, you know, immigration officer, a black woman was there at the counter, so she asked me, so what brings you to the United States, sir? So I said, well, I've come to, uh, I'm sorry, this was, not for the, uh, this was not for the Oscars, this was for the US IBC, they were giving me an award for cultural ties that bind. I was going to Washington DC. So I said, I've come to receive an award. And what award would that be, sir? I said, it's an award for writing a book. And what book would that be, sir? I said, Slumdog Millionaire. Oh, really? Can I, you know, can I hug you? So that was quite incredible. And then when I reached uh, Washington, of course, uh, the next day we had a meeting with Hillary Clinton. And, uh, you know, she uh, also had engaged with the film, definitely, if not with the book. And I gave her a copy of the book and we had a selfie taken together. So I thought this was an amazing coincidence that a film has appealed not just to the classes, but also to the masses, you know, from an immigration clerk to a secretary of state of the United States. Both have related to this film. And yes, there has been a lot of controversy because of the title itself, I suppose, uh, in, uh, in Madras, they filed a case against the producers saying that by naming your film Slum Dog Millionaire, you have called all of us living in slums as dogs. I mean, this was a case filed by the Slum Dwellers Association of India. And they even filed a case against me. And then I had to point out that, excuse me, but my book was called Q&A, not called Slum Dog Millionaire. So then I was uh, sort of taken off the respondents list, but they did file a case and it was thrown out by the uh, High Court of course saying that no, no, it's just a word, you know, it does not mean anybody has become a dog. But when they lost the case, they went out and they bought two dogs and they named one dog Simon and one dog Danny. So, <laughs> so this does tell you that this film did impact people in a, in a multiple uh, ways uh, in the sense. But I always say, why do you look at only at the slum dog part? Why not at the millionaire part? Because what is eventually the subtext of that film? that a slum dog can become a millionaire, that somebody who's been given no chance in life can overcome the odd and emerge as the winner. And I think that is the lead motive of India as well. Uh, today, if you look at the way India is uh, growing at what 7.9% was the growth in the last quarter, uh, many people are saying that the sleeping, you know, elephant has finally woken up uh, and, and is, is, now dancing. is now dancing as per the economist. <laughs> Now you're, you're playing the part of your external affairs ministry role as spokesperson for the government. It must be very hard for you because uh, the, the creative balancing act as a, as a person who, uh, who indulges himself in fiction and then has sometimes difficult, a difficult job defending certain viewpoints. I've given up my schizophrenic existence. I'm only now the official spokesperson. I'm not the writer. So no more books? Or to no more and books. Today you're here as a writer, a stroke official spokesperson? I don't know. Uh, I mean, spokesperson. have to ask Gateway House uh, <laughs> in which capacity have they invited me. <laughs> okay, um, Kabir, I wanted to ask you, you made a, a, a string of very, very successful films which have um, bridged commerce as well as a strong message that you wanted to convey. Do you think cinema itself, movies, can be agents of change? And ha can you actually export uh, a cultural thought? I personally believe that Bollywood definitely is one of the uh, strongest elements that India has in its soft power. Because in all the travels as a documentary filmmaker, and I traveled extensively with 
uh, uh, with a journalist called Saeed Nakwi, who used to always focus on this. Uh, you know, we did about 60 countries. And um, in, in, in traveling in all these countries, I realized the moment you say India, or you're from India, the first thing they mention is either an actor's name or they start humming a song. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to actually narrate a little story about how India's soft power, or maybe in specific Bollywood, actually saved my life. And that's, that's the day I realized how powerful uh, Bollywood is. Um, this was 2001, November 2001, and the Americans had started bombing uh, the Taliban regime, which was crumbling day by day. And I was going into Afghanistan to make a documentary, but because we were Indian passport holders, we could not go through the usual Peshawar route, which most of the journalists uh, were taking. So we had to fly over Pakistan. We went to Uzbekistan, drove to Tajikistan, and from, from Dushanbe, we were trying to enter Afghanistan. And it was a dead end. Uh, everything we tried would not work. We tried to drive from the Shambe over the mountains and there were landslides and avalanches. We had to come back. The river was in spate. We couldn't take the boat across the uh, river. Um, there was a chopper that we were supposed to hire that crashed the day before we were supposed to take it. So it was like a dead end. We were there for 14 days and just not being able to enter. In fact, I remember while we were there, Saeed Nakfi had also come and you know, had said, welcome to the dead end. And then he started, you know, he spoke to the ambassador there. They tried to get help from the MEA, nothing was working. And finally, on the 14th day, when we had more or less given up and said, okay, let's go back to Delhi because there's no way we're going to go to Afghanistan, I did one last um, attempt, me and my friend Rajan Kapoor. We went to the air base and we saw this Russian military helicopter being loaded with medicines being taken to Kabul. So we decided nothing else is working, let's do it the Indian way. So we took the Russian helicopter aside and we offered him some money, <laughs> well not some, actually gave him $2,000. And he hid us uh, in the cargo of medical supplies and the chopper took off. And it was just 40 minutes through the Hindu Kush mountains and we were somewhere outside Kabul. And this big Russian chopper comes down uh, somewhere surrounded by mountains and he says, okay, now jump. I said, jump, what do you mean jump? We give you $2,000, the least you can do is put us down. He says, no, no, there's some technical jargon about if the chopper goes down, it needs some, uh, you know, minimum amount of time to fly again, and he'll go off the radar, and, you know, he said, jump. So we jumped, um, you know, from 20 feet up in the, uh, in the air, and landed up, and this chopper takes away, so it takes off, and me and Rajan are left in the middle of nowhere. Everywhere you see, there's just snow-clad mountains, and we don't know where Kabul is, and then we see this one lone figure marching towards us, and as he came closer, we realized he's six feet four inches by probably four feet wide, and he looked angry because he just saw this chopper come down, two guys jump off, and this chopper takes away. And he was shouting something very aggressively, angrily, and you know, uh, with his Kalashnikov in hand, and I, I really thought, okay, this is it. This is the way my story is going to end. And I was getting all kinds of morbid thoughts about, so what happens to the bodies and they lie in the mountains in Kabul? How does, how does, how do people know? And all that was happening in mind as he came closer, saying something in Dari. All we kept saying is Hindustan, Hindustan. And suddenly this man stops and he gets a smile and he starts singing a song. Mere sapano ki rani ka tum. That's the day I realized. I want to be in Bollywood because it's the most powerful medium we have in this country. So I think that's the soft power of Bollywood. That's a fantastic story. But with your experience with uh, Bajrangi, because that did run into some controversy, and right now we are dealing with uh, a controversy of a different sort, but also in the same, I would say, it's about the same issues of censorship and freedom of expression and uh, how far can you uh, go. Uh, what was the controversy that you actually faced and what was the reaction from Pakistan with that movie? Because it's a very emotional movie about a little girl for those of you who haven't seen it. The controversy, unfortunately, about Bajrangi Bhaijan was all homegrown. Nothing really happened, you know, across the border. Um, what happened was that while, when I announced this film, um, so, okay, so before this, just to give you a backdrop, I'd already come on this uh, um, um, famous list or infamous list of... Uh, um, love jihad, right? Because I'm married to uh, Mini Matar, who's a Muslim, so uh, I had been put up on this list along with, um, uh, you know, a very illustrious actually list with Amir Khan and Shah Rukh Khan, you know, Muslims who had married Hindus, so we were on this guys who were doing love jihad. So when I announced Bajrangi Bhaijan, some of people thought it's a story between a Muslim man and a, and a Pandit girl, and I started getting hate mail about, uh, you know, why am I making a film about Love Jihad and I'm being funded by the Arabs. I wish I had, I didn't get a penny from them. Um, uh, and um, 
uh, lots of sort of cases, PILs being filed by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and uh, people coming, you know, accosting my mother outside my house, a lot of drama. And then finally we released the trailer of Bajrangi Bhaijan and for those who have seen the film, it's obviously not about this uh, uh, love jihad, it's about this devout Hanuman uh, devotee and uh, when they saw the trailer they said, wait a minute, this can't be about love jihad, this guy is Bajrangi. So then they said, okay, now what do we, uh, you know, uh, focus on? So then I get a PIL lodged in um, um, Allahabad High Court by the VHP saying that Bajrangi Bhaijan is blasphemous. You cannot put Bajrangi and Bhaijan together. And then that tamasha started. Um, what was strange, which actually uh, in a way um, reflects what happened with Urta Punjab, is that I can understand a VHP getting perturbed, I can understand them getting upset about, you know, Bajrangi Bhaijan in their point of view, skewed point of view, they, ha they think it's blasphemous. Uh, I think it's the greatness of India that allows us to put these two together. Um, so the censor board actually started getting affected by this and when I went in for the censor, who thought this is a very contentious film and we should just not see it, you know, we ostriches, let's dig a hole, put our head in and pretend that it's not there. Uh, they pushed my uh, sensor screening uh, to about a week before release, which is really the 11th hour because you need to get our prints out. And uh, they said, you know, we feel that Bajrangi Bhaijan is uh, not appropriate and it can create a problem in this country. And so uh, they thought they were being mag very magnanimous. They said, but sir, you can take your pick. Take either Bajrangi or Bhaijan. So I said, no, I don't think I'm going to take a pick. I'm going to take both together. Fortunately, I think they realized that it's not a battle worth uh, fighting and we got away with it and didn't have to go to the, to the high court. But yeah, so I think there was nothing, you know, from across the border, but there was lots of drama here within it's our... It's as world. absurd as the censors probably suggesting, which they did, not censors, but one gentleman, that take either Urta or take uh, Punjab, or can't, you can't have them both. But I mean, that's the state we have been reduced to, but I'm so glad about the high court uh, verdict and it's a great big step forward in terms of freedom of expression and, and yeah, freedom of everything, freedom itself. So you go, you have, um, you have a, a PhD which you've done in art history from the University of Zurich, but you've been associated uh, with art and with Asian art of not just passionate about it, uh, you're seen as an expert. Have you faced uh, any situations, particularly with contemporary Indian art, now that you're heading Saffron Art, uh, with, with, for example, I was, I was thinking about the Bupen Kakar um, retrospective, which is on at the Tate right now, which has gotten into a whole lot of uh, needless controversy because one art critic uh, sitting in London didn't like the work and tore into it, and everybody in India, it seems to have ruffled too many feathers. Are we hypersensitive about our art? And does our Indian contemporary art actually have an audience besides the NRIs internationally? Who buys us? Uh, yes, thank you. I was actually at the opening of the Bupen Kaka show in London at the Tate Modern. And I was, to be honest, not impressed by the way it had been curated and put together. They brought together many of his great works, but they hadn't sort of assembled it in an intelligent way. That was annoying to me. And that particular art critic actually, I think, had a personal vendetta with the Tate more than anything else. So it got a bit distorted, it got out of hand. It's a little bit of a missed opportunity from the Tate's perspective because we've seen the validation of artists such as Gaiton Day by the Guggenheim, which has had enormous impact internationally and on his pricing, as it has with Nazreen Mohammadi which was a superb show at the new Met Breuer in New York. So we do seek this international validation, which changes things. Who buys Indian art? Indian art has an enormous potential from my point of view. I've looked at it from the outside. I'm now privileged from my point of view to be on the ground in India, to see it emerge and do my bit that I can contribute to help it uh, grow in its esteem. Uh, when I was working for another auction house uh, before, I made the case to do organize an auction here in India. Why? Because I saw most of the buying activity coming out of India itself, as it rightly should be. We saw this happen in China years back. Once you have the economic power, you buy into your own heritage. You, you identify, you're proud. And that's, so, that's how it should be. And it was particularly the NRIs in America who first, they were self-made. They had made their own money and they bought into their own heritage with a sense of pride. And it was quite a wonderful thing to see uh, uh, then. 
now we're at a new stage. There's a kind of second wave of NRIs, but it all feeds back into India. So when I made the case at the time, they said, oh, we're not sure, should we invest in India? We think we should invest in Brazil, these emerging markets. I said, hold on, how can you even compare? How can you think like that? You're forgetting India has 5,000 years of history behind it. I strongly believe in the power of culture and civilization and art. India stands on the shoulders, on the broad shoulders of an extraordinary civilization. Uh, and to me, it's surprising, you know, when does an artist, for instance, have a breakthrough? Why does it take 50 years since independence till Tayeb Mehta gets recognized, or Gaitonde for that matter? Why and when does it happen? Those I find interesting questions. For me, it's, it will happen, as we say here. There's no question about it. How can we maybe accelerate this? And how can we maybe capitalize on the power? Art is an ambassador for its source nation, always. So, uh, Prime Minister speaking about make in India. I think let's remind ourselves also of made in India. What made India great? What are the great things of the past which will help us make India even greater? Lovely thought there, Hugo. I think Kabir like wanted to, to interject. Yeah, I just wanted to say, when you say we've had some lost opportunities, in some cases, I would agree. And this is something like, for example, I think Vikas will agree, the area of Central Asia. It's a place that I've traveled extensively. And the first time I went in was uh, in 92, which was just after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And ev everywhere we went in, in, in the erstwhile Soviet Central Asian republics, whether it's uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or uh, Tajikistan, Everywhere we went and they realized we were Indian. First they would recognize us as Indians and be really warm and effusive. And they would keep saying, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. And I, I would keep wondering, why are they calling us Jimmy? Till I saw posters of Mithun Chakravarti and it was written in Cyrillic scripts. So I didn't know what's written. I read there are only five characters. I said, five characters can't be Mithun Chakravarti because it will need, need a whole poster in itself. Uh, and then I realized it was Jimmy, which was his name in Disco uh, Dancer. And Jimmy was all over, and if it's not Jimmy, it was uh, Raj Kapoor, if it's not Raj, you know, they were just only talking about. And I went 10 years later, there was no Jimmy. There were only Chinese pop stars and Korean pop stars. Jimmy had disappeared from the streets of, of, uh, so it, of people, I, I yeah. felt it was a huge missed opportunity from the point of view of India to have moved in culturally through their soft power to have asserted and you know had uh, grown uh, that relationship so s sometimes when people laugh uh, about uh, the potential of our soft power particularly in the context of bollywood and they say besides butter chicken and bollywood i mean the world doesn't know anything beyond that and his world is not particularly interested uh, what are the sort of efforts that uh, the external affairs ministry is making to get that awareness going. Because uh, even when all of us travel, there was a time when, um, just before 2008, when in fact, when I wrote my book on India, when I felt there was a certain jauntiness when Indians were at an airport, there was this feeling of optimism and pride. And uh, suddenly that flagged, and I can see a bit of it re-emerging. Uh, what, what are the actual efforts that are being made. I mean, Iran was a fantastic initiative. And suddenly, especially across social media, all I am seeing, certainly, are wonderful images from Istafan and elsewhere. And we're talking about uh, how much synergy there is, how our crafts people can learn uh, the tiles uh, and various other skills where there's such commonality, which now, perhaps, for the first time in many years, we are waking up to the, how wonderful that kind of synergy can be for both our cultures, both ancient cultures. So that effort, and if you could just talk about if you did accompany the Prime Minister on that particular trip, what was that experience like? I think Kabir is absolutely right. I went with Prime Minister on this trip to five Central Asian countries. And in each of those, you know, every evening there would be a state banquet hosted by the president of that particular country. And in every state banquet, they played a Bollywood, a Hindi film tune. You know, whether it was Mera Juta Hai Japani or uh, any of the other songs. But in each of these places, you know, uh, Omeri, uh, Zohra Zabi, uh, all these films, they were playing the songs. Their local orchestras were playing the songs. So this tells you, I think, Kabir, uh, uh, don't take it amiss, but I think that connect is still there. It's still there. Maybe it's not visible as much in the streets and markets 
uh, as it used to be in the past, but the very fact that when Prime Minister went there, uh, we, we heard these tunes played by their own orchestras means that they do relate to uh, this facet of, uh, of Indian culture. But uh, you ask that what are we doing now to sort of uh, promote Indian soft power? I mean, one example which uh, stares us in the face right now is the International Day of Yoga. I mean, the Prime Minister gave this call, uh, you know, in September 2014 for June 21, which happens to be the longest day of the year in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, to be declared as the International Day of Yoga. And the United Nations obliged. We got the International Day of Yoga declared for June 21. And after that, there has been an explosion of interest in yoga. In fact, we ourselves, uh, you know, through the efforts that we made, managed to have it celebrated in 192 countries across the world. You know, out of 193, the only country we could not do it was Yemen. And for obvious reasons, you know, it's a warlike situation happening there. So that tells you that, you know, our ancient spirituality can be melded with modern, you know, branding techniques to create uh, awareness about uh, the tremendous soft power potential that we have. How do we restrain some over-enthusiastic people from claiming uh, we sent a man on the moon uh, and we were the first people to invent uh, uh, head transplants centuries ago? It's also part of the problem. I mean, the minute we say that in, a, in, a, in, a, in the public domain, it makes, it makes us look somewhat ridiculous. No, I think that is a problem of the internet. It, you know, you can, anyone can start an internet rumor uh, within seconds. You know, Nostradamus said this and something else. 9-11 was predicted by Nostradamus and things like that. So that is an issue of the internet that when you Google something, you come up with 10,000 results and all of them may not be accurate. What sort of damage control do you do when a minister says something of that kind? I tweet the clarification. Hugo, I wanted to ask you about the antiquities that we have managed to get back from the United States. You must have to deal with a lot of such uh, issues yourself in the sphere, because dealing with Asian art in the past and now specifically with Indian art, though not antiquities. But um, what, what can we do to make sure that art, Indian art, in all its complexity and beauty and, uh, and just the richness how do we make that somehow accessible to the rest of the world? Well, um, there's a very good system in India for the antiquity side with the Archaeological Survey of India. Anything over 100 years needs to be registered and it has the name of the owner there, which gives very clear title and makes the situation actually very clear. This will be a very important thing going forward. I would speak for uh, having a, a liberal market within India itself so these things can be, uh, which is possible now, perfectly possible, uh, be handled and change ownership because there's something about living with these things, identifying with them and uh, enjoying them every day. People often ask me, you know, I would, I'd like to, I would like to invest in art, what should I buy? The investment is art, yes, art is an asset class of itself. It's much more than just a financial gain that you potentially might have. You gain from it every day, living with it, enjoying it. Something emanates from it. So I would say it's an important thing maybe for India to consider to facilitate the return of cultural heritage, make it easy. Maybe they don't have to be registered right away when they come, only when it's clear who's bought it, then you register the new ownership. Um, make that easy, make the, that, uh, that will help in a sense these situations that was a particularly terrible case of someone having uh, looted pieces and these were returned, rightly so, and this is a very, very important step. But I think, you know, the awareness through this, actually the awareness will grow in India. If I look at the museum, museums, there's a long way to go in a sense to improve the presentation. It's about sort of respect how you show something. I believe very much in private initiative here. There's some very wonderful cases such as uh, the collector in Delhi, Kiran Nada, who's taking the initiative of putting a museum together in absolutely superb standards, uh, curating shows, and will present them in the best possible light. This happened 100 years ago or so in America. It was the Rockefellers, it was the Huntingtons, it was the Morgans, it was the Fricks. It was private initiative to lead to the great institutions in America because it was a feeling of giving something back, giving something to share with the community. And this uh, is happening now. If you look at the Prince of Wales Museum, what Director Mukherjee has done is extraordinary. The vision of an individual can change the way we look at things. It's about perception. 
It's about how we want to communicate it. So all of this is happening now. There's a way to go still, but this will fundamentally the change how we ourselves look at it here in India, and then we can carry this message out to the world. Kabir, I wanted to ask you about uh, the relevance of socially sensitive cinema. We seem to be very, very touchy about uh, displaying any of our so-called uh, weaknesses to the outside world. We'd rather present a fantasy. And yet it's movies like Sairath, and I'm sure Titi will also get that kind of recognition. Uh, your documentary, some of your films have also attracted a, a, the right kind of uh, attention internationally. Do you believe that the film industry on the whole and we as, as a people uh, have very thin skins and we want to project only a certain sanitized, prettified version of India and Indian culture abroad? Um. I think filmmakers, um, firstly, I, I, I always get a little uncomfortable ab about, you know, when people say Bollywood or people say the whole film industry as sort of one mass of people because we really are made up of a lot of different individuals with diverse ideologies and, and point of view about things. Um, but what the problem that's really happening that I'm seeing right now is, is this whole narrative that is being built up that the moment you critique anything in your country, you're being labeled anti-national. Uh, you know, so if you're making Urta Punjab talking about a drug problem in Punjab, you are essentially defaming Punjab. Uh, I've never understood this argument. Uh, it, it, we, we should be able to, uh, in fact, if we are critiquing something that's going wrong in the country, it means probably we love our country more than the others who are being just indifferent to it. So I think that is a problem which uh, over the past couple of years one has been facing um, in the film industry whenever you're trying to take a hard stand on something, uh, on, on a certain social, uh, social issues that are always trolls and all these people who are coming after you and saying you're being an anti-national and you're by, you know, by uh, highlighting a certain problem in the country, you're actually doing disservice to the country. Um, I think yesterday's uh, high court uh, verdict is definitely a, a big step in, in trying to counter that. I think it's, it was really, we did need some intervention. We were looking at some sort of intervention maybe from the Ministry of INB um, that didn't come um, from the ministry, but I think the High Court verdict has really come in and, and it's a big step because it's going to embolden filmmakers to be able to take on subjects without, you know, and, and with the knowledge that if one sort of maverick certification board chief doesn't agree with you, you still have recourse to go to the court and get your film out. Um, so yeah, I think we should just continue. I think there are certain battles that are worth fighting for and we should just keep continuing making the films that we feel are important and relevant. You know, when uh, Arun Jetli mentioned last week that uh, we can anticipate radical reforms as far as censorship or film certification goes, it was slightly ominous because one didn't know quite what to make of it. So in this atmosphere of um, suspicion, how does the government, what is the kind of official position on this? Uh, A, to have supported Palaj Nilani in a position that was clearly um, unpopular by any, by any standards from the point of view of the audience and from within the industry itself. It's, it's tough, but when a man who is heading this uh, film certification board uh, makes a press statement that he's proud to be known as Narendra Modi's chamcha, it's hard for someone like yourself, a very creative, liberal thinking person, to be in a position where you might have to defend that. How do you do it? Luckily, I need to defend only the Ministry of External Affairs, <laughs> not any other ministry. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm happily not placed in that position where I have to defend the indefensible or something like that. But I, I think the government has made its position quite clear that it stands for artistic freedom. Mr. Jaitley has said that the censor board will only certify films and will not censor films as such. So let's wait for that moment. I think they need to take this seriously. Uh, we, we in the industry get a feeling that the, the uh, government actually do takes a very, f you know, looks at the industry in a very frivolous manner. You know, it, it's almost like, oh, this is all uh, song and dance and tamasha and it's not. But they need to realize that Bollywood is a very strong influence across the world and they need to be more, they need to sort of recognize that and therefore be more involved in what is happening with Bollywood uh, because 
our films are traveling out. You know, today a big mainstream film like a Bajrangi Bhaijan released in upwards of 40 countries around the globe, and that's only in the first phase. Then it releases another 10, 12. So if you're reaching out to 50, 60 countries and many more through uh, uh, pirated uh, uh, DVDs, uh, it, it is uh, an industry that they need to, you know, take notice of. I remember in the case of one of my films, uh, New York, which was uh, which had the backdrop of post 9/11 illegal detainees. Um, um, it, 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 it sort of did great business, but uh, the Syrian ambassador, the then Syrian, Syrian ambassador had met uh, Shekhar Gupta, who was then the editor of Hindustan Times, and he said that every family in Syria has watched this on, on uh, pirated DVDs. Uh, and he was surprised, he said, you know, we're really surprised that this film, film, film came from India. It should have come from one of the Arab countries because most of the victims were Arabs. So I just realized at that point in time how powerful Bollywood is. And we were together, Vikas and I, at the Cairo Film Festival where New York was the opening film. Uh, and that's a rare, um, um, so, you know, for, for, for a film that's already been released to be the opening film, uh, it's a rare honor. So it just showed that our films are being watched across the world and therefore our government needs to take uh, notice of that. Because I, when I was watching Sairat, which is a very, very powerful film, which does not sweep caste and um, the hierarchy and the oppression of caste politics in a small um, village, not village, a small town in Maharashtra, I thought to myself, would a filmmaker push the envelope in today's times and perhaps tackle something like the beef ban and what happened to Aklak? We have the right to do it in a democracy, and it was a, a turning point in our social uh, our history. So how far do you think a filmmaker can go in today's times, and it's worth going, and what will it do in terms of uh, asserting yourself as a creative uh, person? I think filmmakers should have the freedom to make a and pick any subject that they want to make, on, uh, make a film on. And um, as I said, you know, Till yesterday, there was always a little bit of nervousness about what's going to happen to your film because, you know, unfortunately, a filmmaker can be brave and, you know, try and uh, approach a subject. But sometimes what happens is the, the pressure of finances, the pressure of somebody else's money riding on your film, all that begins to... Uh, pressurize the filmmaker into diluting the vision or dilute what they want to say because you know come when you're closer to release you're really soft targets there's a lot of money riding on the film you want to see that you know people who have put inve invested money need to get their money back but i think yesterday's verdict has really as i said emboldened filmmakers and i hope uh, you know um, filmmakers step up and pick up all kinds of issues whether it's the beef ban uh, to which I had, you know, loosely alluded in my chicken song uh, in Bajrangi Bhaijan, which is also one uh, bone of contention for them, uh, no pun intended. But, uh, uh, you know, they, what basically this, this Bajrangi who was this devout Hanuman uh, Bhakt and is a vegetarian was celebrating the fact that if the little girl wants to eat chicken, she should be allowed to eat chicken. I won't eat it, but I can celebrate and sing and dance about it. Um, but I think a more direct approach also on all these issues should be taken. Um, and, and I hope from now on filmmakers will do that. Yuga, I also wanted to ask you in the same context that uh, a lot of painters, artists, have been facing uh, pressure or persecution. I mean, um, after MF Hussein, the entire atmosphere in the country changed as to what can be displayed in galleries, what can't, what can attract uh, vandals, uh, whether a museum itself uh, will be vandalized, whether the artist will have death threats. Has that in any way inhibited even your selection when you're thinking of what you can put up for auction? Do you screen it with perhaps that at the back of your mind? That if I put this piece of work up, will, will I have run into some kind of official problems? Well, we do, I mean, we do think about these things, but ultimately art has to be about freedom of speech, and we must uphold that. Now, you know, sometimes it's a market consideration, okay, maybe we might not be able to sell that particular thing very well, so maybe it's not a wise thing to offer it. Also, it's a function of, of different aspects, but ultimately we want to uphold the notion that art has to be free in its expression. As filmmakers, you are thinking about that too. We have the power of a voice that we can literally voice and we can speak up. So we should do that, but with consideration. Um, the thing is we offer art internationally. We can do an online sale. Where does that take place? You know, where is that sp space in cyberspace somewhere? So it's not in a particular location. It can't be vandalized anywhere 
in a sense. So that offers a new opportunity. You can be targeted personally and so can the owners and the promoters of Saffron Art who do live here in India. I guess that's true, but I've never, we've not, not worried about that actually. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. So uh, one final question to all of you that on a very positive note that uh, Vika, starting with you that uh, we know our incredible immense potential as a soft power. How can we possibly take it forward in, a, in an aggressive, meaningful way so that five years from now, if we are at a similar seminar, uh, we'll be speaking a different language and uh, maybe there'll be uh, many more elephants dancing in the room? I think the first thing to note is that, as Kabir also said, that soft power is beyond Bollywood and curry. You know, uh, soft power really is the power to win friends and influence people with the strength of your ideas. And India is a country which has never lacked in ideas. I think one of the earliest ideas that came out of India was of spirituality. And even modern India remains a deeply spiritual place, a place where, you know, all the religions of the world coexist and co-mingle. And uh, most importantly, in a post 9-11 world, we are a model of upholding diversity. I mean, many people started saying multiculturalism is dead, uh, you know, post 9-11, etc. But we, I think, provide a very living example of how different faiths can coexist in an atmosphere of tolerance and pluralism. Then the other thing I want to point out is the Indian diaspora. They themselves are the biggest brand ambassadors of India's soft power. When you meet a techie in New York with the name of Vaidyanathan, then the image that comes into somebody's mind is, oh, he's an IT expert who can repair my laptop in a second. You know, but in a sense that harks back to the notion of India as a knowledge economy. And I think finally and most importantly of all, uh, India's greatest soft power is being India itself, a nation of varying beliefs, faiths, creeds, castes, traditions, languages, and yet embodying that spirit of unity and diversity. So I think it's that image of India as a country where you know all kinds of people, all kinds of ideas can coexist at the same time without necessarily evoking conflict, I think is the most powerful soft power that we can, uh, we can project to the world. Thank you, that was extremely well put. Thanks very much. Deserves a round of applause right now. Uh, Kabir, what would you say, I mean, how can we capitalize on uh, over 100 years of powerful cinema that is our legacy? And maybe we have not been able to do it uh, as successfully as it deserves. I'll tell you what, one of the, of course, there, you know, there is um, the way Bollywood is. I mean, the, the, the grammar and the language of a Bollywood film. It's hugely accepted, accepted and appreciated in, say, the Middle East. Uh, North Africa, in uh, Southeast Asia, with all its sort of song and dance and, you know, um, melodrama. But that has been a problem in that brand of cinema reaching out into, say, Europe and North America, because their tastes and sensibilities are different. Now, something that has actually held us back from trying to reach out to those markets is that actually we don't need those markets. We are uh, one of the few in fact, maybe after Hollywood, the only film industry in the world that's self-dependent. Our audiences support us in such a big way that we don't need funding from any other market. So that's, uh, whenever I've, I've gone to festivals, this is a question that's often asked to me, that why are there not more Indian films being sent to the festivals? And I keep telling the reason is that we sometimes don't, we don't have, the, we don't feel the need to. We are really happy with the way we are um, making films for India and the way it's being accepted by the audiences. But having said that, I think the new bunch of filmmakers are definitely coming in and there's a new language that uh, that's evolving. There are films that are being made that are now, you know, almost every year we see them at Cannes or Toronto uh, and other sort of prestigious uh, film festivals across the world. So we need to nurture those films also. I think we need to, you know, um, sometimes we tend to say, that, oh, hey, let's go for these films and sometimes we poo-poo the traditional Bollywood. I think there needs to be a mix of both. Uh, and if we do that, then as a, as, a, as a film industry as a whole, I think we'll really be able to go out and, and conquer many more theatres than we're doing right now. Thank you very much. Hugo, because I know we're running out of time and we do want to take questions which have been curated for us, uh, I just wanted to ask you very quickly about uh, any new potential big stars on the art horizon that uh, you have identified and who could take, take this legacy forward? I don't want to necessarily mention any particular names, but as we have spoken about it, you know, India's society 
as a diverse culture that can show the way of how we all live together, I think is a role model for the whole world. And India's art and culture represents us a sublimation of that. It's everything together, the things that touched India, but it was also the thought leader for so many things, spirituality, Buddhism, Hinduism, and how that touched so many people and how, how alive that is today. Buddhism has a sort of resurgence everywhere around the world as a philosophy in a sense. So I see the, the constant renewal of creativity out of India based on this coming out of history. There's a constant thought process there. Thank you very much. We'll end uh, with uh, quoting Narendra Modi, uh, who often talks about the Upanishads and uh, the concept of uh, one world family and uh, Vasudeva, Kutumbakam. So uh, it's a wonderful, inspiring thought that at the end of it all, we are one and uh, we all have our powers and our strengths and uh, we should recognize those and uh, maybe the world will be a far, far richer place if we did that. Do we have time for questions? I think we do. Oh, wonderful. So if... Uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Um, a question from a member of the audience, um, Kishore Mande, which is, uh, how does soft power actually translate into hard influence, um, certainly on a state to state level? Can you give any examples, perhaps, of where you've seen that in action and, uh, and influence matters um, of a slightly different type at a state level? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, uh, spirituality. Uh, look, for 3,000 years, India influenced countries both to its west and particularly to its east without sending a single soldier across its borders, whether it is the Buddhist legacy in countries like uh, Japan, Korea, China, uh, Laos, Cambodia, whether it is the Ramayana tradition in places like Thailand or uh, Indonesia, um, or whether it is the uh, temple of Angkor Wat. These are all, you know, concrete examples of India's soft power continuing to influence those countries. The entire Buddhist legacy in these countries is emanating directly from India. So I think, and eventually they shape perceptions about India. For instance, our electronic voting machines have now stood the test of billions and are being exported to other countries around the world. So the moment you see an electronic voting machine, you immediately think of India, you think of Indian democracy. The ideas of uh, non-violence, which uh, have you know, impacted people from Nelson Mandela to Martin Luther King. Uh, again, a concrete example of Indians, India's legacy of, of ideas. So these are all ex examples of soft power which have translated into hard influence because when into these countries, there is already a bedrock of, uh, you know, of positive sentiment for India emanating from India's soft power. It's, if I can add to that, it's about the export of ideas. The Silk Road in the past was about this. Uh, and they acted as bankers in a sense. They, they, they supported all the, uh, the traders going to China, coming back, bringing their thing, things. And it was real hard currency that came out of that in a sense. Today, it's the same idea. The Silk Road is very much alive in a sense. It's the backbone. And trade, uh, we were talking about free markets and, and the exchange of, of, of uh, uh, labor. So this is actually very, very much alive as a concept. Another question, this time from Chris Alexander of Canada, who's um, asking about the opportunities for the film industry and working together with IT and with the digital media in really um, reaching a larger audiences um, and pushing soft power to have larger influence. What's your view on that? That is definitely an area that the industry is looking at because that's, that's the way um, to go in the future. Unfortunately, um, Bollywood is afflicted by piracy and that prevents us from effectively, you know, getting our content out uh, on digital platforms because by the by day two, um, you know, our films are pirated and already they're uh, flooding the internet. And that's becoming a huge problem that there has to be, again, some intervention even from the government side. How do we battle that? Um, one of the reasons actually that happens is because we're not being able to legally reach out to... Uh, Bollywood hungry people. We're not being able to legally reach out to Pakistan sometimes for most of our films are not going there. And the need for piracy comes from there. How else will, you know, say the people in Afghanistan or people in, in Pakistan and Bangladesh watch our films because they're not being uh, released there uh, most of the times. Uh, so we need to in some way uh, ensure that we battle uh, piracy and that'll, that's the only way we'll be able to move forward in terms of spreading our uh, content on digital platforms because otherwise by day two it's anyway all, all out there for free. 
Last question, um, which we should be even allowed, is uh, looking at this issue from uh, the opposite perspective. We've talked about uh, projecting India overseas, and the question I've received is about projecting um, foreign countries in India. What is India influenced by at the moment? Um, what are the trends? Which countries have done a good job in pr presenting their, their culture here? External affairs? I mean, Hollywood is a prime example. You know, fan was beaten by a Hollywood exactly. movie. Exactly. Um, that tells you that uh, we are, and you know, whether you have the McDonald's, the KFCs, uh, you know, these are all examples. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Vikas? No, I mean, I believe in Mahatma Gandhi's dictum. You know, I don't want my windows to be walled and my doors to be shut. I want the breezes of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. Now, that's a real global citizen, somebody who's yeah. confident of his own culture and then can embrace other cultures because, you know, he, uh, he knows or she knows that the other culture is not going to supplement, uh, supplant his or her own culture because they are confident in their own being. Sure. So we should start our own uh, idli dosa outlets definitely across the world because I believe it's the best fast food, healthiest fast food on earth and uh, we haven't done enough. Now that's a soft power we should be exporting. Thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience. Thanks again.